Hi, everybody. I'm Bob Baker with Jazz Guitar Today, and we're here with Rodney Jones, and we're very excited to talk to him. Uh, before we go any further, I'd like to remind you that we really appreciate it if you subscribe, ring bells, like our content, share with your friends. It makes such a difference in growing this community. So please do that. And with that being said, we appreciate the maestro, Rodney Jones, here today to, to hang out with us and tell us what he's been up to. So, well, I'm glad to be here, and I second everything you said. You know, jazz is a, is a music of communication and connection and human connection, and so, you know, liking something or commenting or sharing is a small thing, but it really makes a big difference. If you think a small thing can't make a big, big difference in your life, Bob, yeah. then you've never spent a night in a room with a mosquito. <laughs> Uh, I've got a mosquito story to tell you, but I'll take too much time. But um, yes, I, I'm absolutely, in this case, it, it really makes an electronic difference because the algorithm that YouTube uses um, to rate our content um, is judged by every like, share, follow, and subscription. And what they do with that, for people that don't know that what, what's going on and why everybody's asking you to do that, is that once you reach a certain plateau, they start recommending your content to other people that like guitar, for example. So you, you start getting recommended for, you know, and, and it really helps you grow your, your, your channel. And so that's why it's, it's in this case, it's really, really important that people do it. And um, so we appreciate that. So tell me what's going on with you. I, I you know, I'm, I'm listening to you play. You sound fantastic as usual. Um, but I know you got some some things that happened in your life. You won a prestigious award. Why don't you tell people about that? Well, uh, I'm happy to. I uh, was selected to receive a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Guggenheim Award, uh, one of I think four musicians this year who got that award. It's it's uh, you know it's a very small club. Uh, they award that for worthy projects and for a life well spent doing something that they perceive has value and sheds a little light and and uh, positivity in the world and that's of course all i'm ever trying to do uh, whether it's through music or through the things i write or just through the people i meet i'm always trying to leave everywhere i have been a little brighter than when i got there uh, and uh i always try to learn from everybody and also try to share something with everybody so yeah i was very honored to receive that i went to a very um upscale uh, fellows dinner where I was there in the company of neuroscientists and and uh, other musicians and painters and you know I, I sort of had the out of body experience like what am I doing here but uh, it was beautiful it's a, it's an incredible honor it's something I never really anticipated but uh, I've spent a lifetime you know doing that so I guess it's an acknowledgement for a lifetime spent doing something. You know, for people that most for people that aren't New York City centric. And there's a few of us out here. Um, some people don't really understand what Guggenheim is. And what that means. I mean, if you're, if you're in and around the New York City area, or you're into the arts at all, you, you do understand what what that name, uh, what cachet that name brings along. So could you just comment just for a moment about the organization in, in, its, in itself? And um, well, sure. I mean, I'm not a I'm not an expert on the Guggenheim Foundation by any means, but um, they they have been people that have funded um, the arts and sciences as well uh, right. for those people that are making a difference in the world. It was established many years ago by, by John R. Guggenheim, I believe is his name. Right. Um, but their commitment. The thing I love about them is they. Uh, uh, they're committed to really bettering the world and the planet through the contributions of those in it. So whether you're an artist or a scientist or whatever, their objective is not just to glorify, you know, you made so many records or you, you have a career, their metric is something different. And I'll tell you the story of my application. Um, I had been asked to write two recommendation letters for people that were applying for that Guggenheim Fellowship. And so I just casually mentioned to my wife, oh, I wrote these letters. To and she's like, well, did you apply at all? I was like, no, no, I didn't. She said, well, why not? If there are people are asking you to write letters for them, maybe you should apply. I was like, well, maybe I should. So I applied and I sent in a bunch of stuff, you know, that they requested. And uh, 
And I got a reply back said, oh, what you send in is great, but we really want to understand what it is you want to do. Like, what does it mean to you to do this? It's not enough just to, you know, to have a great resume. There's lots of great resumes, but what's different? And so then I wrote back from the heart about what I thought real music really meant, the difference it could make in people's lives. And that that, you know, aside from, I mean, I want to play great and I want to be excellent in music, but I'm interested in, you know, not just telling my story, but playing music that holds a space for others to find their story in it. Sure. And when I shared it that way, they were like, well, now that's what we want to do. And then that's when I was able to get that award. So, I, you know, it was a, it just shows, you know, I was my true authentic self, you know, as great as my career has been, that was not the, the tipping point. The tipping point was when I spoke from the heart about what it really meant to me. And so I'm very grateful that, that there is an organization with resources that cares like that. I mean, it's very right. impressive. They didn't have to do it. You know, they didn't have to write back and even say, do some, they just could have rejected it out of hand, but they cared enough to say, well, maybe there's something here. Let's go a little deeper. And so, you know, my, 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 um, you know, my gratitude to them, the, the head of the foundation, the general named Edward Hirsch, um, who's a very, um, a man of deep character and principle. I'm really indebted to the Guggenheim Foundation to have that attached to my name for the rest of my life and beyond. And I'm very honored there. Anyone can Guggenheim can uh, Google the foundation and see the fellows and you'll see the company that right. they say I'm in. And I'm, I guess I'm worthy to be there, but uh, I'll let someone else be the judge of that. I'm just doing the best that I can day by day. You know, they've got a, a beautiful museum in New York. Is that Sixth Avenue it's on? Fifth Avenue, I believe. Fifth Avenue. Okay, I'm sorry. It's been a while since I've been in New York. Uh, it borders the park. I I once was lucky enough to stay in one of the homes right right like three or four doors down. Wow. Back in the yeah, it was a pretty incredible. Uh, back in the that would have been in the '90s, probably the early '90s. I was. You there. knew somebody. Actually, um, no. Uh, it was uh, it was a it was a funny thing. There used to be this thing before BRBO. There was a um, there was an organization that um, put together places where people could stay, and there were it was a kind of a very high end thing. And my business partner at the time, um, you know, just sought this place out, and uh, we did we stayed at a gorgeous place in San Francisco, right next to the bridge, you know, and and wow. you know, and then in this place in New York, and. Um, and yeah, when we when we got to where we were going, I went, holy camoli. I mean, we were like right there. And um and come to find out that um their uh, the HOA, you know, the, the homeowners association of the building got wind of what she was doing. <laughs> I see. And we were the la her last clients. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but she was very that, that was before you sold your two million shares of Bitcoin, I guess. That yeah, was... she was she was an artist and um and, 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 you know, she had, a, um, you know, trust funded. I mean, she didn't need the money. She did it just to get to know other people and artists and stuff like that. Really cool lady. Really, really cool lady. Anyway, um, well, the Guggenheim is, um, you know, I mean, f for you to get that is, is beyond incredible. Uh, for, for, a, for a jazz guitarist to get that. I think is beyond incredible. I, I mean, I'm won't, I'm not gonna claim that I know if there's any any others that have ever gotten it, but you know, I mean, one other guitar player that plays jazz got it. And he's one of my students, uh, oh. Rez Avasi. Okay, good. And Rez was one of my students at Manhattan School of Music for I think two or three years, and well, you, you he gotta, received it maybe four or five years before. You gotta so. love it because, um, you know, that's that's for your you personally. I mean, that's a a validation and a recognition of a life well spent, if you know what I'm saying. And, uh, and, and people have, um, you know, people recognize, you know, the value that you bring and continue to bring, and they want you to bring more and they're making it uh, easy for you or easier, easier, easier. easier for you. Yeah. I mean, let me correct that. So that is, that is really cool. What are you doing on the, uh, on the playing side? I've been really busy yet. There's a beautiful, uh, club in Brewster, New York, which is about 75 minutes from New York City, uh, called Uncle Chief. The owner is a is the saxophone player Ian Hendrickson Smith, who's the horn player, the saxophone player with the roots on the, the TV show, Jimmy oh, Fallon's wow. TV show. And uh, he's a wonderful, he and his wife opened this beautiful club. It's a world class club in a 
small upstate, you know, Hudson Valley town. Yeah. Um, but the sound system, they spared no expense to make everything right. The sound system is perfect. The stage is perfect. The equipment is perfect. The food is world class. Everything is right. And uh, and the musicians don't have to order off a musician menu. We can order regular food like everybody else, you know. And, uh, and, and, and I mean, and, and they compensate us well. And so I've been playing up there once every three or four months. And I just finished a weekend uh, there this past Friday and Saturday, uh, July 5th and 6th, with uh, Benito Gonzalez on piano and Lonnie Plaxico on bass and the great drummer Russell Carter. Wow. And we, we did, uh, you know, four sets of music over two nights. And uh, I'll be back there uh, in September doing a, a, a duo quartet with myself and Peter Bernstein in the rhythm section. And wow. that's going to be fun as well. And t- tomorrow night I'm playing with uh, Frank Vignola, Frank Vignola, which is uh, July uh, 10th, 2024. I'll be playing with him. Uh, I love Frank's playing. What a great, great player and a lovely man, just a beautiful human being. We we get along like two peas in a pod. We, we, we have different aesthetics, you know, we sort of come from different places. But yeah. the ground we meet is is that we love music, we love swinging, we love making it happen. And he knows how to make me sound better, and I know how to make him sound better. And it's really a unique, beautiful thing to experience. And I, I just I thank him. It's his gig, and he has invited me to do it. This is the second week in a row to do it, and it's really a joy just to to be there. And uh, the great pianist Ted Rosenthal is playing as well. I know Ted's amazing. Uh, yeah, it's it's a good thing, good time. Well, you know, I, I mean, Frank is one of my all-time favorite people. Period. I, I mean, I told him that. You know, I've got a bromance with him. You know, I mean, I just, yeah. I, just I just, I just love Frank. Uh, as a human being, I mean, he's just second to none. And as a, as a, as an authentic guy, you know, you used that term earlier. He's just as authentic as it gets. And um, his playing is second to none. I mean, he's as good yeah. as anybody. And and his sense of music, um, and his generosity and you you hit on something you know he I, i've got a, a video of me playing with him and he made me sound good and um if you can do that you're a me <laughs> yeah. he's really something i just will complete this the story that you asked uh i'm going to be going out to san francisco to do a week of teaching with mimi fox the wonderful guitarist oh, yeah. out there I love me so we're gonna she she runs a a, a jazz program uh, i think it's california jazz conservatory i believe it's what it's called there's a week long program and I'll be part of that. And then I'm doing a, a jazz camp uh, with Greg Wachala, who's another great guitarist, a Benedetto artist. And I'm just going to go and do a, a sort of a master class and performance for his students. Then when I come back, I'm going up to upstate New York for the uh, alternative guitar summit or alternate guitar, alternative J- guitar summit. And uh, yeah, it's going to be amazing. Mike Stern, John Schofield, um, uh, Kurt Rosenwinkel, yep. uh, Lod Hexelman, myself, I believe Camila Meza uh, will be there and it'll be combinations of playing and teaching together and asking questions. I'm, I'm interviewing John Schofield, which should be really fascinating to uh, ask, to have someone like myself ask different sorts of questions than a, a, a beginner guitar player, or even an intermediate or advanced, but there's a lot of common history John and I share and, and uh, I love him and I'm looking forward to, to spending time and, and sharing with him. And, and then after that, I'm also doing a, uh, there's a Berkshire jazz camp run by uh, a wonderful trumpet player named Richard Bulger uh, that, that uh, works to really in, instill value, musical values and the love of joy of jazz in students up in, uh, in Massachusetts, in Western Massachusetts. So I'm going to go up there for four days and do that. You know, I'm, I've always considered myself a teacher who can play, not a player who can teach. So when I'm teaching these things, no, really, I mean, that's that's my self-identification. So when I'm teaching, that's what I feel like I'm born to do when I'm playing. It's like, oh, that's something I can do. It's a, it's an interesting thing, but a teaching is what I feel like I'm there to do. Playing is what I feel like I'm, I'm able to do. Well, it's funny that you mentioned that. I mean, for people that, that, you know, that need reminding that you are on the uh, faculty at Juilliard for several years 12 um, years uh, 12 years and um you know that that little music school you know uh <laughs> and yeah, had school of music for 30 years <laughs> and the Manhattan school I mean you know like you know you're uh um the the uh institutions that 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 employ your services are you know the top some of the top schools in the world you know well students don't care what you know till they know that you care and, and to be a great teacher, you've got to be willing to plant a tree under whose shade you'll never sit. 
<laughs> and I'm cool, and I'm okay with that. You know, I'm okay with teaching students knowing that their career, the arc of their journey is going to be long after I'm gone, or I won't be part of it. And and uh, but I'm okay with that because then they will then have the effect of helping others and and offering some some love and joy. You know, Art Blakey said, "Music washes away the dust of everyday life," and I think that's right. So anytime you can give people some relief and help them to find their story or to you know to feel better about where they are that's a that's a worthy thing to spend a lifetime doing i'm happy to support people to do that well you know i i mean i my hats off you know as always my hats off i mean i, I do know that about you and i appreciate you sharing it um you know the um the thing that is uh i guess it, it the thing that it's not surprising that's really and the, the word that i'm looking for the thing that i admire let's use that word um, about you is that you are a hell of a player. I mean, you like there's There are no, not as much as it used to be because there are other educators out there that can really play, but you know, 15, 20 years ago, a lot of the guys that educated, they, they really weren't very, they just, yeah. they really weren't players, you know? Yeah. And, um, but you, um, you know, I mean, every, when people talk, when we're watching you play or listening to you play and all that kind of stuff, or I'm talking to other players about you when your name comes up, it's never like, oh, he's a pretty good player for an educator. They don't even, they don't, they don't even, the, the fact that you do that the thing that you, you know, that you identify with is really not even part of the conversation. You're, you're being, um, uh, you know, honored. I'm going to say, or, you know, you're being hailed, hailed as, yeah, just a, as a guitar player. You know, as a musician, as a guy on the bandstand, if you will. That's not well, I give it all. When I play, I, I, I intend to, you know, to give it all, you know, yeah. and to give it for real and to, and to make everyone else in the band sound better. And I, I uh, you know, I'm just grateful. I mean, I, I live, you know, I have this idealized life, you know, that has had its ups and downs like everyone else. But, uh, you know, to have been associated with Dizzy Gillespie since I was 18 years old and to have... <laughs> you know, sat at his hand learning jazz, um, you know, it pretty much says it all. And then Lena Horne as well, and Chico Hamilton, and Ruth Brown, the great rhythm and blues singer. And, uh, you know, I've just have been able to be around these, and I've seen, you know, these masters of music, and I've seen um, the level of devotion and care that many of them, not all of them, but many of them have, uh, and it inspired me um to to do that you know and and i'm inspired by something my father told me you know my father was a a minister for 60 years you know and he told me he said you know you're never going to be judged by god by did you succeed but you're going to be judged by did you try <laughs> and, and i've I, and i have taken that to my musical career you know right. like I, maybe i don't play everything perfectly whatever but whenever i have the guitar in my hand i i have there's never a time when i'm not giving 100%. I'm not ever phoning it in. I'm not ever, you know, trying to fake it. I'm always trying to fully be present and make the music happen. So I think that people um, respond to that. And also, you know, uh, like, like Frank is the same way, you know, I don't come with an agenda. I don't come to make, you know, to prove anything, you're going to make anyone uncomfortable. I come to just have a, have a good time and to give the audience something of value, you know, because they don't get the time back. They, they, people can get more money, you don't get more time. You people, right. someone's going to spend two hours of their life. They're not going to get those two hours back. So what am I offering a value for them? Right. And uh, so I, I, I endeavor to, to do that and to, you know, to be a true, genuine, authentic, accessible a human being. You know, I, 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 the way I feel about it is I'm a beggar just like everybody else. I just know where there's some food, you know, <laughs> and, and, and the music is the food. You know, the, if you don't play music, we're all beggars in the world. We're all trying to figure it out. But I have a place where I can go and receive sustenance, which is this music. And not many people have that if they don't play. And if they right. don't receive that food offered to them through people who do play for that reason, they still don't get nurtured. So that's well, my every job. Every time I've seen you play, you know, I will, you know, you always look like you're having a, uh, you're having a good time and you're so comfortable in your skin. You ever seen Wes Montgomery play? Yeah. On those videos? I mean, does anyone look more at ease? You know, he's playing the most incredible, like, Mount Everest of jazz guitar, and he's looking like he's like, you know, I think I'll get pizza later, you know. He's looking, <laughs> <laughs> looking like, so I was inspired by that. I'm like, if he can do it, you know, maybe I can do it. Well, you know, there's not that many guys. That every a lot of guys have got that guitar face thing going on, you know. Yeah. And, um, and there's nothing wrong with that and all, but but there's something to be said for somebody. You just 
um, you know, th where you feel like you just know they're comfortable. Yeah, they're making me when they're comfortable, they're making they're 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 making music, you know, for their audience. And they're they're there to, to communicate. And, um, and and they consider I consider the audience part of the band. Oh, yeah. So well, I'm not are. playing at them. I'm playing for them and with them, you know, yeah. to have this experience. You yeah, know? That, well, there's a there's a you know, there's a, a vibe, you know, there's a there's a, a give and a take. And, and that's that's incredibly important. And it's not just if they applaud at the end of the tune, you can you can it's palpable in the room. If if you know if there's a connection, but you know just you mentioned something earlier. There's two things I wanted to talk about. We, we're got, um, you know, you mentioned some of the people that you've played with, and every time I look at your list, I just go, huh, what? Um, and I can't go through all of them because there's just there's just too many of them. But you know, you you were you recorded with Ray Brown, Kenny Burrell. Um, Larry Coriel, who I, you know, I was a favorite of mine for a long time. Dizzy Gillespie, Chicky Hamilton. I mean, Chico Chica. Hamilton. I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm not reading well. Christian McBride. Um, I'm going out to L.A. with him to play at the Hollywood Bowl uh, in early September, and I'm doing a workshop at uh, USC the day before. That's gonna be fun. Man, you gotta love that. I, that is such a that is such a cool thing because, you know, he he. Obviously, he can pick anybody he wants, you know, and his music is, you know, authenticity. He's all about that. And so for him to identify you and say, hey, I think that you're my parallel on your instrument, you know, in terms of the vibe. deep honor. I'm doing his next record with him in September. Also, he you know, he is uh, Christian is one of those generational geniuses on his instrument. He's a brilliant writer, arranger, composer, uh, a real savvy business person. Um, and someone who loves what he's doing, you know, I, I don't really love traveling all the time and always playing before people and yeah. always being out there, but he does. And he, he fulfills his life like he loves what he's doing. And I really admire that. But yes, you're right. It's an honor because he can hire anybody. And um, anyway. I, I, so whenever he calls me, I'm honored. I give 100 percent. You know, I I do my very best. I think what I bring to the party is years of experience. You know, I bring you know, if, we, if I'm, you know, he called me and we did a, a, a tribute to Frank Sinatra and Peggy Lee, and it was a bunch of all-star thing and a bunch of celebrities. Yeah. Well, I've played that music for 40 years, so I'm not guessing what to play. I know the right things to play, when to play, when to fill, when to not fill, when, how, where to voice the chords, when to, you know, when to give the singer their note, when to not give the singer, like, that's something that experience is taught. And I think that's the value because lots of people can play, you know, but there's some players who just have a lot of experience. Russell Malone, someone who has a lot of experience oh, yeah, in that kind of stuff too, you know, but not, a, but there are other players who are really great, but don't have that kind of experience. So, you know, I'm not the only guitar player that he calls, but he calls me for, for certain sorts of things for picking for his big band things, because I like playing Freddie Green style. And I like, you know, being part of a big band. I like that. And I've done some small group things with him too. I was part of his uh, tip city trio. Yeah. Uh, when I left, then he hired Dan Wilson, and that became Dan Wilson's uh, job after you that. You know, it, it's funny. I did a, I, um, I once did sound for him on a, on a, on a gig. Uh, there was a club in Atlanta that he came down to play, and um, at that time, they did not have a full-time sound man, and I, I have a background in, in, in that. And um, so so I had to, you know, uh, sound checks at like 2.30, 3 o'clock, something like that. as a trio. Piano trio, and uh, he comes. Uh, he comes walking in right about the right time, and I introduce myself, and he comes up and I I gave him a little tip on the room because uh, I felt like you know it's just something that, that he would need to know. But anyway, so he said, um, he said, okay, well, good. So we, they do the sound check, and uh, he plugs his bass in. We get a tone up. He goes, okay, you know, the piano player gets this thing up, okay drummer you know everything okay i mean we're talking this whole th that that whole time frame was like a minute and a half yeah and then he goes okay uh you know one two three four and they kick into something they do about 10 measures maybe 12 and he looks at the drummer he says you okay yeah he looks at the piano player you okay says, yeah that's it we're done and he's and he's walking he's walking out the door. Now we're talking. This is we got five minutes has gone by, right? And he goes, uh, "So how's that for sound check?" 
<laughs> well, that's experience, and, and you know, and he, he winked at, and he winked at me because he knew, you know, he just knew, you know. Yeah, I mean, he has so much experience. He knows immediately if it's going to be right, and he knows immediately if you're right. Yeah, it was, it was, it was really well. That particular room, uh, the bass, uh, it, it's very, it's, it's a little bass happy. It's, it's got a big resonant, and um, you, you know, it was. I just said this is something you, you, you may or may, with your experience, you may not need it, but. Sometimes the you know anyway no big deal but anyway but he was great he was really really great and of course the show was great he and um, he's got a vibe you know his, his vibe is um, you know I can see you two guys getting along on stage yeah we do I mean he's he's a consummate professional he's a virtuoso oh, yeah. uh, and he he is a virtuoso also on the electric bass and the upright bass right. and uh, you know I've been around some of those people Marcus Miller is someone I was around when you know I taught him bass lessons when he was a kid you know who. <laughs> Was a virtuoso. Kenny Kirkland is another one who's a virtuoso. Not everybody is a virtuoso. George Benson is a virtuoso. And, the, and then there's the rest of us who play really well and are, you know, who, who find the value in the music. You know? Well, I got a couple more questions for you. Um, one is, you, you mentioned something that um, I'd like you to just touch on a little bit. And that's the, the difference. I, I, you, you didn't mention this, but I'm going to, you, you made me think of a question that I've been asking people a lot lately. The difference when you're playing in a combo, people that don't have a lot of experience playing in a band, short, small band, you know, piano, guitar, bass, drums, maybe a horn, maybe not a piano, you know, what, what are you listening? What, you know, what, what's the key to being good at that? And I, you, I know you're going to say ears, you got to listen, you got to listen, you got to listen, but can you, can you, can you add, can you add something that what, well, a lot of guys just aren't very good at it. Yeah, well, I, for me, the key, first and foremost, before ears and all that, is to not believe it's all about me. That's the key. You know, to go into that environment and say, what's going to make the music sound the best? Right. And if I can do that, then I'll find my space to shine. I'll find my place to do whatever I'm going to do. But my first thing is to say, what is going to make the music the best? Is that that determines the volume. You know, whether I'm, how much I'm playing, how much I'm not. If the piano player is busy, I'm not busy. If he's in a low register, I'm in a high. If he's in a high register, I'm in the low. If he's playing single notes, I'm playing chords. If he's playing chords, I'm playing single notes and fills, you know. And, and you know, where's the drummer's beat? You know, my the guitar is the rhythm section or my part of the harmonic part, portion of the group. These are all judgments. You know, do I play things that lead the horn player to play other things? Or do I play things that support where he already is? How do I parse that? It, it is this magical, um, intuitive, experiential thing that happens, but it all begins with a willingness to not say, well, I'm Rodney Jones, you know, you, don't you know I'm gonna do me? <laughs> I never I never enter that space. My thing is I'm Rodney Jones, and I'm here to make the music sound as good as possible. That's what I do. Man, that was, that's the best answer anybody's ever given me. You always say that about me. Yeah, well, it's because it's true. I mean, you know, I lo I, I love it, Rodney. I, lo I love I love your vibe, man. I love what you do. I, I love you, man. I love you, man. It's mutual, man. I have my, let me just say something. People don't realize the depth of work and effort and what it is to do what you do, man. You are the John Coltrane of this thing, man. You 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 <laughs> are, and I I admire and love and respect what you do. You know, everybody that's out front taking the bows are not the heroes. They're you know some heroes don't wear capes, and you're one of them. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. I, I, I I'm just gonna say thank you because anything else I say is gonna sound like that'll be the lead of the article. Yeah. That'll be the lead. Some heroes don't wear capes, and I'm one of them. By Bob Becker. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, but but I mean that that's really it's really important to understand, and that that happens um, dynamically within a piece. You know, I mean all of that stuff. What you're talking about, like, am I am I Am I part of the uh, the rhythm section here, or am I, you know, am I part of the harmony? You know, you know, what am I, what am I, what am I doing here? And um, you know, that happens dynamically within the piece, and and having the knowledge that what's going to make, in reconciling that with how do I make this sound as good as I can make it sound. And the key for all of that, Bob, is is what is the appropriate thing to play. Right. If you play the appropriate thing and play it beautifully and brilliantly and magnificently, right. that's great. But if you play the right thing in the wrong place, it's going to be wrong. If you play the wrong thing in the right place, it's also going to be wrong. So you've got to play the appropriate thing at the appropriate time 
and that's it. You know, and if you want to talk specifics, if you the first thing is you've got to make the rhythm happen. You've got to be rhythmically locked in with where the rhythm is. Right. You can't be you know the one man marching one direction and the rest of the band is going the other direction. You got to see where the the consensus of the band about what it's going to feel like and then make that as good as possible because the, as a guitarist particularly i don't have the power with the guitar to change the rhythm section the bass can do that drum can do that and to some extent the piano can because of the volume but guitar can't really do that in that same way so i'm i try to find who, who's you know what is the lock between the bass and the drums and how do i fit in with that based on what the piano player is doing or if there's no piano, then how do I fill that space and make it happen, you know? Or how do I leave space for something else to happen, you know? Well, yeah, that's, 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 that's what that, you know, anybody that wants to know, just put this on a tape loop and keep listening to Rodney say this, because that's incredibly important and it's, it's spot on, you know, it's- uh, I'll send it's, you my PayPal. Uh, <laughs> don't send it to me, I'm broke. <laughs> <laughs> we can post it. Anyone that found that just them helpful. We'll the, definitely, the, we'll definitely we'll post it. We'll definitely post it for sure. Um, uh, let me see. There was one other thing I was going to ask you about. It was, uh, I, ah, maybe that's it. I don't know. Anything else you want to add? Another one. Oh my God, was, that was the big windup. I'm waiting for the second question. Oh, I know. I'm trying to remember what it was. It was uh, I had something about, you know, playing, playing in combos. Um, I, I, well, rule number rule number one, because you and I are about the same age, I think. I'm a little older than you. Well, I don't know how old you are, but but rule I'm, number one. I'm 73. Okay, so I'm 67. Okay. Okay. So, well, not that. Yeah. Okay. So here, so here's the point. De facto, going to a gig, never call it a combo because you're immediately, you're immediately like one step from Bo do 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 23 skidoo. <laughs> you know, like I, I, I if know. you call it a combo, immediately the younger players you're playing with are like, oh, this guy. I, you know. I know. You know, you know what they the the school that uh, the school that I went to they would call it you know they would call that class combo and I I always like Ooh, you know yeah. but uh, the, the other thing I think is important Bob is that I've never lost my my sense of curiosity about the music and what's possible you know it's not right. a child it's it's not a childish thing but it's a childlike thing I I hear music and it's still mysterious to me right. even you know and I do certain things to keep that deliberate for example. Solos that I really love by other people, I never learn or analyze because I want them to be magic. I want to hear, every time I hear it, I want it to be magic. Like, what is that? Oh my God, what is that? I don't want to be like, oh, I know what that is. Oh, he's using the melodic minor. That takes the fun out of it for me. And that's an ability I have in my own head that I've had since, since I was a young boy, which is I can become the listener and turn off my brain that knows music and I hear music like everybody else. I don't know the chords. I don't know the key. I couldn't tell you what they're playing. I can just enjoy it. Or I can switch hats and know exactly what it is, analyze it, know all of it. But I can choose which, which Rodney is showing up. And that is so great because when I hear great players, I don't want to go here. You know, I don't want to listen to John Coltrane in concert and analyze, spend my time analyzing, well, oh, he was using the monologic minor. Oh, this is the Locrian scale he used here. And he did. No. That's not the, I want to experience the music in my heart. The, the heart intelligence, right. there's, three, there's three intelligences that music, musicians use. Right. There's the, the mind intelligence, right. which is the weakest. There's right. the ear intelligence, which is better than the mind intelligence, the next right. best thing. But the, the evolution of that is the heart intelligence, right. which is where does the music land in my heart and others? That's the thing. When it resonates there, I'm good. You know, but when I go see a show, I don't really see as many as I, as I, for the last seven months, I haven't seen anything to be honest, but, um, but if I'm going to a show and I'm going to see somebody that I want and I'm paying attention to the, to the music on an analytical basis, then I, I'm not, I'm not having fun. You're not getting fed. Um, yeah, I want to go and to be just as you know, just 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 be just as mesmerized by what's happening and just turn it off and and just just really really you know dig what's going on on this you know on the stage and not even think about it. I, I kind of you know one of the one of the meta analogies I will say that if you're doing that, it's like taking a hike in the mountains and having your nose in the topographical map. Instead yeah. of looking at the, instead of looking at the mountains in front of you, or reading a great menu for a fantastic restaurant but never ordering the food. 
<laughs> all of the above. You got, you know, you got to get out there and and just let it come in. And and when it does that, then you know, then you've done the, you know, then you're you're part of the art. You know. Welcome to two old jazz musicians in conversation, already in progress. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're you're right about that. So, um, what else is going on? We're talking about because we're talking about world lessons. You know, world lessons are teaching at Juilliard, teaching at school of music what this scale is, this mode. But world lessons is what you learn through living, what you learn in the bandstand, what you learn through your journey, and that is always the higher higher expression. You know, the, the best parts of music are always caught and never taught. Well, that I, I would agree with you. You know, well, the other thing that you you know you you see is. Um, you know, it's how, it's how is this making me feel, not how is it making me think. Yeah. And um, you know, if I'm listening, if if I'm listening to a lot, of, and I I have in the past, I've gone listen to a lot of musicians play at the jam sessions where the younger the younger guys that are in school or just out of school, and I'm listening to them play all their lessons over their solos in the jam sessions. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And I'm not listening to them make music. I'm listening to them doing that. And then obviously as they get older and, and I, I, older is, is not necessarily I say more musically mature. They don't have to be very old, you know, uh, but um, you know, then, then all of a sudden it's, it, it changes, you know, you don't hear, you don't hear that. You hear melodies, you hear harmonies moving, you hear stuff that's going on and, and that's what you're into. Well, we all start from somewhere, you know, and I think Wes Montgomery, he did that interview. You've probably seen it. And the guy says, well, Wes, you're one of the, great guitarist and Wes, I'm paraphrasing, he says, no, I'm not. And the guy's like, yes, you are. And he says, no, I don't play guitar. <laughs> and the guy's like, Wes, you're Wes Montgomery. And he said, yeah, but I he said, guitars are like Kenny Burrell and, you know, Barney Castle. Those are guitars. He said, I'm not a guitarist. And the guy's like, well, what do you mean? He said, I just use it. I use the guitar to play the music I, I feel, but I don't, I'm not a student of the guitar. I'm a student of the music. Right. And I use the guitar to, to serve the means of the music, not to learn the guitar. And I find that um, I've endeavored to always be both because as a teacher, whenever I learn something, I always ask myself, you know, if I had to explain this to someone, what would I say? While I'm learning it in real time, I'm saying, if I'm going to explain this to someone, what would I tell them both about the process of how I'm learning it and what to expect? And, uh, you know, and then I say, well, once I know it, then I then forget it. Then once I know it, then then it's not about the journey of learning it. It's about the wisdom from applying it. Right. Yeah, like we talked about playing A blues and playing the blues. It's good to play A blues and play the all, the all A blues you want. Right. But when you say, you know, my life story, it, it's connected in this way. And you play that, it has a power and a, a reach that the other thing does not. You know? well, I, 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 that, that's really, really good. Rodney, thank you, man. Thanks for coming on board today and sharing your wisdom and um, any uh, any recent recordings that you want to remind people of? The Infinity of Things is is one that's available on Bandcamp. I'm Rodney Jones. If you go to Bandcamp and type in the Infinity of Things, there's a lot. I think I have 20, 20 CDs worth of material up there in all different styles. Um, you know, my my email address. I don't mind saying it publicly. Is, no, is no. Soul Manifesto S O U L M A N I F E S T O Soul Manifesto at Gmail .com. And I do teach online and, and uh, some in person and stuff. So, um, but that's it. Yeah, I'm just a real person doing my best to, you know, to, uh, you know, I, I mean, my, I'll close with this. Yeah. My, the thing I, I believe, you know, well, if I were going to have one of two things on my tombstone, I've told my children, if I were, I'll be, I'll be cremated, but if I were going to have a tombstone, it would be this. <laughs> the first thing it would say is this. See, I told you I was sick. <laughs> that's the first thing it would say you know and then then the second thing is this everything in life happened for me nothing in life happened to me meaning that i don't consider myself a victim i think right. everything is an opportunity to grow you know you can't climb a mountain that's smooth and so the mountain of life the mountain of music requires obstacles and and walls in order to give me the strength to learn how to climb and to learn how to go up the mountain i have to pull myself up on something there's nothing there to pull myself on to slide right back down so that's the first part. The second part is, I believe and I know in my heart that everyone, no matter their walk of life, who they love, how they love, how old they are, their race, religion, gender, creed, don't care about that. I believe everyone's life has value 
and matters, that it's important, that, that, that you know, the journey people take has a value. Now, it may take a lifetime to discover that, or you might know that very early on. But I think that's a worthy pursuit to, you know, but it begins with accepting, you know, I have something here. It's not about being Rodney Jones or West Montgomery or Grant Green. It's about being the best you. Right. You know, being the best you you can be. And that's something that no one else can be. And you are enough. That's what I know about everyone I meet, that they're enough. And I know that about them, whether they know about them, it's another thing. So then my, my work in the music is to help them to get to the point where they recognize, you know what? I think there's something here I could do. And I'm like, yeah, you got it. <laughs> Rodney, I love you, man. <laughs> I do. I, I love you too, Bob. Thanks for that, all you do and all that you are. And, oh, man, I'll tell you. And with brothers, that, my friend, we are Bob, your brothers. Bob Baker with Rodney Jones for Jazz Guitar Today. And we... We got to connect up again in a couple more months and, you know, refresh all this. I, 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 I mean, Herb Wong, do you remember him, the writer? No, I'm sorry, I don't. Herb, Herb Wong was a very famous jazz writer in the, in the 60s and 70s and through the 80s, actually. And, and uh, he did an interview with me, I think, in 1991 or something like that. And I, after we, and I didn't know what he was going to say, you know. But no. when the interview came out, he said, Rodney Jones was like the Tony Robbins of jazz guitar, <laughs> you know. And I, and, you know, and I said to my wife, I said, you see what he said? My wife was like, yeah, basically, that's what it is. You know, that's kind of, <laughs> like, it is. It is. I, thought I was just playing jazz. Guitar. He said, well, you're kind of like the Tony, you know, all the uplifting life coaching stuff. You, you are kind of that guy. I was like, yeah, I guess I am that guy. So, so I'm comfortable in my own skin. I am that guy. You are that guy. All right, brother. Thank you so much. All my love. Talk to you soon. Same same back at you, Rodney. Well, thank Take you, everybody, care. for listening. Thanks for being here. Thank you, buddy. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Take care.